Now I would like to invite Chancellor Rebecca Blank to the podium for what has become an annual tradition, the Chancellor's State of the University Address. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to see you all here. Welcome to those of you who simply had to come from a few blocks away, and welcome to those of you who traveled from a long distance. It is always great when our most loyal alumni come to town for advisory committee meetings and for homecoming. And I want to thank you for all you do for this university. While, yes, it is true we appreciate checks, we know that there are many ways in which our alumni give back, mentoring our students, sending great students to us, providing internships, hiring them after they graduate, all of the ways in which you support this university, we appreciate. So thank you for that. And let me join Sarah in congratulating our four absolutely wonderful Distinguished Alumni Award winners. Let's give all four of them one more round of applause. <laughs> now last year I started my talk by giving you all a quiz and uh, people seem to really like that. So I thought, well, gee, let's do it again. You know, what's wrong with a quiz? So I'm gonna test your badger knowledge. Now, there are pencils on every table. If you pass those pencils around, you've all got a program or something or your name tag in front of you that you can write on. There's only gonna be five questions. You know, and don't let the person next to you cheat. No phones. All right. Question number one. Let's see who knows this. After Dane County, which Wisconsin County sends the most freshmen to UW Madison? That's one for our in state people. Which Wisconsin County, after Dane, sends the most freshmen to UW Madison? It's question number one. Question number two. After Wisconsin, which U.S. state sends us the most students? That's for our out-of-state people. <laughs> After Wisconsin, which U.S. state sends us the most students? Question number three. What is Bucky's full name? <laughs> and you only get credit for this if you include the middle initial. What is Bucky's full name? Question number four. What is the best-selling Babcock ice cream of all time? What is the best-selling Babcock ice cream flavor of all time? And question number five. What was the first building on campus funded entirely by alumni gifts with no state money? What was the first building on campus funded entirely by alumni gifts with no state money. Got all your answers? All right, number one, Waukesha County <laughs> sends the most students after Dane. For those of you who want to know what is three, four, and five, it's Milwaukee, Brown, and Outagami. Question number two, Illinois sends the most students. Sorry guys, you got that wrong. Illinois. Applications from Illinois are about double what we see from Minnesota, for those of you who guessed Minnesota. Question number three. Bucky's full name is Buckingham U. Badger. You gotta know that. Buckingham U. Badger. Question number four. The best Babcock ice cream flavor of all time Vanilla. What do you expect? I'm told that's followed closely by chocolate chip cookie dough, but vanilla wins. And question number five, there's a table over here that better have all gotten it right. The Memorial Union. <laughs> Charles Van Hyes worked with alumni and students and raise money after the legislature killed the funding. All right, how many people got all five right? Stand up if you got all five right. 
Anyone? Oh my gosh. Number four, how many people got four out of five right? All right, stand up if you got four out of five right. They are really great badgers. Three out of five. All right, we got a bunch of those. Two out of five. One, I'm not going to ask for zeros. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you all one extra credit question just to see if you can get another point on the board. All right, extra credit. What team holds the record as the only team in NCAA history to play for 15 straight years in both a football bowl game and the NCAA men's basketball tournament? What's the answer? The Badgers. You all got extra credit, see? With the opening of Alumni Park two weeks ago, we've been thinking about what are the things that make this place special? Our history, our culture, our traditions, and about all of the people who are writing new chapters in that history. All of you, our alumni and our current students. So even if you're on campus fairly often, you may not know about all the good things that are currently happening, and let me share just a few of the highlights. We just welcomed 43,000 students, including an excellent freshman class, the largest in our history, from a record-setting 35,000 applications. This is the 10th year in a row that we've set application records, and our newly enrolled students this fall come from 47 countries, 43 states, and 70 Wisconsin counties. We're missing Iron and Florence in this year's freshman class, so if there's anyone here who can send someone to us next year, we're counting on you. Our retention rates, freshmen returning from their uh, freshman year to their sophomore year continue to be at all-time highs, over 95%, which is well above the Big Ten average and the average of other public schools. <laughs> People who come here want to stay here. That reflects our deep investment in great teaching, and I'm very proud that U.S. News & World Reports now ranks UW-Madison in the top 10 public universities in the nation for our commitment to undergraduate teaching. Our graduation rates are also at a record high, and time to degree is at a record low. Our undergraduates complete their degrees in an average of 4.03 years. That's uh, four years, one and a half weeks. Want to know who's spending that one and a half weeks? <laughs> it is key to keeping student debt down, to get students out as fast as we can with good degrees, and we do that. Now, no highlights reel would be complete without a mention of Badger Athletics. In 2017, the Wisconsin football, men's soccer, men's tennis, women's golf, and women's hockey teams all earned NCAA Public Recognition Awards for posting academic results in the top 10% of their sport. I know Barry's here, and he and the coaches and the advisors there deserve enormous credit for what they do with the athletes. You might have seen the Wall Street Journal's annual ranking of top football programs just last month. UW was the number one most admired program in the country for our combined performance both on and off the field. We play by the rules and we win. And I should note, we're ranked number five in football right now. <laughs> In short, UW is an excellent educational institution, and the steady improvements that we've made over the last decade, even in the face of serious budget challenges, reflect the commitment of faculty and staff and the dedication of all our alumni and friends. We have four top priorities that we've established. Number one, enhancing the educational experience. Many of you remember those big introductory lectures where you sort of sat in the back of the class and had to peer to see who the faculty member was. We're flipping those upside down, using technology to make them more interactive and more engaging. We're strengthening our investment in student services. One of the reasons why Money Magazine named UW Madison's career services among the top five in the nation. And we're enhancing opportunities for students to learn outside the classroom. We're now the number one public university in the nation for students participating in study semester study abroad programs.
expand our Badger Volunteers program, sent 1,600 students into the community last year to put their knowledge to work, tutoring 10th graders in algebra, conducting water quality tests on our lakes and streams, and growing fresh vegetables for food pantries, and much more. That's goal number one. Enhance the educational experience. Make sure we keep doing it better. Goal number two, improve access for all students. My goal, which I've said to this group in other years, is that every qualified student who we admit can afford to come here. We're not at that point yet, but that is the goal. Right now, we lose top students because we don't offer the same scholarships that they receive elsewhere. We're working to expand support, particularly for low and middle income students. Through the Always Forward campaign, and thanks to many of the people in this room, in the past four years, we've raised money to fund 1,000 new scholarships for undergraduate and graduate students. Thanks to all of you for that. We're also directing more institutional dollars into need-based scholarships to close the gap that many students face. That is, we're plowing a certain share of our dollars from tuition back into financial aid. 10 years ago, we spent $13 million of our own money on financial aid. Today, we spend $58 million. It's still not enough. We still lag behind many of our peers in the Big Ten. So we continue to push on this front as well. Just last month, I announced a commitment to first-generation students that we call the Badger Promise. It guarantees at least one year tuition-free to first-generation college students who transfer from a two-year UW school. For a variety of reasons, many first-year students, whose parents, those are students whose parents don't have a four-year college degree, start at regional two-year campuses. If they take the classes and they get the grades that allow them to transfer into UW-Madison, we want to make sure they can be successful. So Badger Promise substantially reduces the cost of a UW-Madison degree for some of this state's most deserving and neediest students. So that's goal number one, educational excellence. Goal number two, access for students. Goal number three, and if you don't do number three, you can't provide the first and second, maintain and grow faculty excellence. That means hiring well, retaining our faculty, paying competitive salaries, making sure we have a research and teaching environment where our faculty want to come and stay. We successfully recruited 105 new faculty since we were together last year, and we're bringing some extraordinary talent to campus. Great faculty are magnets for talented junior faculty as well as top students, and they bring in big, important federal grants. Named faculty chairs and professorships are one of our most powerful tools to compete for top faculty. And over the last two years, we have created 199, you could make it 200, 199 <laughs> new named chairs and professorships on this campus. That is a game changer, and it wouldn't have happened without the people in this room. Thank you. Last fall, I also announced that we're restarting our cluster hire program for new faculty. That program is designed to strengthen interdisciplinary strength in some key research areas. So we're going to be soliciting proposals from around the university. Each one describes a key research area and proposes three faculty hires in three different departments, all of which will feed into research on that area. It is a wonderful way to create synergies across campus in areas where we want to grow faculty and want to grow our reputation. We hope to hire three to five clusters this year and each year over the next several years. We last ran a cluster hire program in the 1990s, and some of our very best faculty on the campus today came through that program. So issue three, make sure we hire and retain the best faculty. And finally, number four, expand and improve our research portfolio. That means making sure our research facilities are up to date, supporting interdisciplinary work through things like cluster hires, and providing research support dollars. There is life-changing research unfolding on this campus in every corner and every day. UW researchers are on the front lines of some of the most pressing problems that we face. Our meteorologists are helping to improve hurricane forecasting. You might have seen them featured everywhere from the Washington Post to CNN to the Toronto Star during this year's devastating hurricane season. Our engineers are modeling natural disasters to help cities plan even better for things like major floods. 
and our bioenergy researchers have built UW-Madison into a national and international hub for work to develop new fuels from agricultural crops. That work is in part being funded by the largest federal grant in our history received last month from the Department of Energy. Keeping UW a top university means investing in all of these areas. Which brings me to the budget. There's always a budget section of these talks, you all know that. <laughs> Over the past two years, we stood up one of the biggest state budget advocacy campaigns this university has ever seen. We made sure state leaders understood why investing in the UW system and UW-Madison is essential for our students and for the state's economy. And I'm happy to tell you those efforts paid off. After cuts in five of the last six budgets, this budget has no cuts and actually put some new money into higher education. That is a major victory. So thank you to everyone who was part of that. The uh, budget restores funding for maintenance so we can do some much needed repairs and improvements and provides money to move forward on a few of our crucial building projects. We wouldn't have this budget if our alumni hadn't gone to bat for us. You are among our most persuasive advocates, so thank you. But if UW is going to continue to be a top university, it cannot rely on state or federal funding. We have to be entrepreneurial. We have to be generating our own revenues in ways that develops and creates investment revenue that we can in turn put into great educational programming and great research and great faculty. So we've been working on six entrepreneurial strategies designed to bring in new dollars to invest. And some of you have heard these six strategies before. The first, which some of you will have noticed if you're on Madison, expanding summer semester. That helps our students make progress toward their degrees. It decreases course bottlenecks. It brings in some people to campus who wouldn't otherwise come. And it creates an additional semester of funding and revenue for us here at the university. It's a win-win all around. So if you were on campus this summer, it might have looked a little busier. That's on purpose. We're delighted to see more students coming summer semester. Number two, growing our master's degrees and certificate programs for professionals. These programs expand our outreach for older and non-traditional students who want to learn new skills, get additional licensing or certifications, and fill needs that employers have. It's been great to see some of our departments um, launch out with some wonderful new master's programs, some online, some in residence, some that are a hybrid between the two, serving all new groups of students through this. Number three, put our tuition for out-of-state and professional students at market levels. We've had six years of a tuition freeze for our in-state undergraduates, but that freeze does not apply to other students. And in my opinion, we need to make very sure that we are competitive in every way, including charging the same thing that our peer universities charge for students who come here out of state, our students who come for professional degrees. And we've made enormous progress on that, thanks to approvals by the Board of Regents that have allowed us to do that. Finally, four. I'm going to say more about this in a minute, so I'm going to pass over it quickly. Looking at student mix and student numbers. Let me move to five. Building alumni support. With your leadership, we have raised $2.2 billion in the last four years toward our $3.2 billion goal in the All Ways Forward campaign. We're going to make this campaign a complete success, and I thank all of you who have been part of that. Finally, um, strategy number six, making sure we can grow research funds. Growing our research enterprise in the face of increasing global competition is one of our biggest challenges. I'm excited by some of the initiatives that are happening on this campus designed to support startup research in important scientific topics. And of course, a piece of this as well is making sure that that research in turn gets to industry and gets into the pipeline of usable technologies that can improve life in all sorts of areas in the state as well as in the nation. We've been very successful with these six strategies so far. I've just described two programs that are possible explicitly because of the new money, new investment revenues that we have coming in through these strategies. One is the Badger Promise, providing access to first-generation students, and the other is the Cluster Hiring Program, designed to deepen our interdisciplinary research strength. But let me return to the fourth strategy, 
looking at and exploring student mix and student numbers. Now, I know there are a lot of you out of there. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you have a child, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, or a family friend who is under the age of 18 or 19 and wants to come to UW-Madison? I know there are a lot of you. I hear from you all the time, right? <laughs> About half of the people here are Wisconsin residents, and half of you are non-residents. But for all of you, I hope this is going to be good news. First, for our Wisconsin residents, our commitment to in-state students is stronger than it has been, in, you know, in, at least in recent history. Our admit rate for in-state applicants was 72% last year. We have guaranteed 3,600 Wisconsin students in every freshman class. The regents have asked us to do that. This year, we actually have more than 3,700 versus 3,600. Now, many of you know something about the demographics of the upper Midwest, including Wisconsin. There are fewer students graduating from high school every year. So as we guarantee a class of 3,600 Wisconsin students, it means we're admitting a growing share of Wisconsin high school students here at UW-Madison. That's a strong commitment. I've already mentioned the Badger Promise, saying for first-year students and those who started two-year schools that there's a way to come to UW-Madison and make it affordable. And we're implementing a new recruitment program aimed at our very top test score Wisconsin students, aimed at persuading them they want to come to UW-Madison, not leave the state. Because if they stay here for college, they're much more likely to stay here for long-term careers. In short, our commitment to, Matt, to Wisconsin is very strong. But if we want more students, we're not going to get them by expanding in-state admissions because of the demographics of this area. So with that type of a strong commitment to in-state students, we want to take advantage of our very strong pool of out-of-state applicants. Applications from non-resident students have increased more than 70% over the last decade. And this is really important. Quality has gone up with applications. That's not easy to accomplish. It's an enormous asset for us. Last year, we rejected 1,300 non-resident applicants whose performance and quality was as high as those that we admitted. So we're exploring expanding our freshman class by 200 to 250 students next fall, primarily tapping into this talented pool of out-of-state students. Now, over the last 10 years, it turns out that every one of our peer schools has expanded their class size by somewhere between 2,000 and 6,000 students. We didn't do any of that. And why didn't we do it? Because we actually had a cap. We had to admit three in-state students for every one out-of-state student, right? And it turns out that if you do that, you lose money. <laughs> so it was a good thing that we didn't go our class. But we're now at a point where the regions have lifted that cap. We've made incredibly strong commitments to in-state students. We're admitting an increasing share of our high school graduates in this state. And we can now turn and tap that pool, at least at a modest level, with small and, I will say, measured and thoughtful increases in the student body. We want to do this in a way that assures a high-quality experience for all students. It will mean, for instance, using a number of the revenues we expect to come in to pre-fund them up front so we can hire faculty and advisors and make sure the departments that are going to be most affected by an increase in students have the resources to cope with that. These six strategies altogether will allow us to make the investments we need to position this university for long-term success. And I want to give real thanks to the leadership at this university and particularly the deans who've been working on all of these fronts with us and are really making all of this sort of entrepreneurial efforts to increase our investment revenue to in turn reinvest in program and faculty. They're the ones who are making this all possible on the ground. So thank you to the deans. But, um, we don't secure our future with money alone. You can't really just talk about money. The question is, what are you doing to create a community? What are you doing to create a first-rate educational experience? We have to make UW-Madison a place where outstanding people from many, many different backgrounds can come together to work and to study. Next month, we're going to release the results of our first ever campus climate survey, along with recommendations from a cross-campus task force. That survey is likely to demonstrate in greater detail what we already know. The vast majority of our students report having satisfactory or highly satisfactory experiences on this campus. That's why we have such high retention and graduation rates. But there are some groups of students whose reports are less positive, particularly our African-American 
and our LGBTQ students, among others, sometimes have a markedly different experience here. Now, we've been working hard on these issues with an array of programs designed to build community and to help students, particularly those who are 18 and coming from very homogeneous communities in some cases, become aware of what it means to live and work in a more diverse environment, because that's where they're going to be for the rest of their careers. But we're not just involving students, we're involving faculty, staff, administrators, um, and we're working with them to say, what do you want to need, and how can we help create this community? This is not just a top-down process. Our campus climate, not surprisingly, is being very much affected by the things we see happening across the country. UW-Madison is deeply engaged in the national conversation around racial justice and injustice and about the way in which this country does or doesn't include those of other ethnicities and other nationalities. So far, we have been fortunate to avoid the violence or even some of the um, uh, free speech issues that we've seen in other communities and on other campuses. We put in place policies and plans that ensure safety as it relates to speakers, protests, and demonstrations. And we do reserve the right to cancel or disallow events when there is a very clear and explicit threat of violence. At the same time, we have again and again stated our strong commitment to free speech and the free exchange of ideas, even ideas that we might all find reprehensible. Academic freedom and free speech are among the most important foundations upon which universities are built. If we cannot talk about any idea, we are not a university. So there's a lot happening in this place. We spend a great deal of time talking about what we do, but we don't always talk as much about why it matters. And the students bring us back and remind us of that. So let me close with a story about one of them, a young woman named Stephanie Henry, who came to UW from Brooklyn, New York. When Stephanie was younger, she was in a car accident that left her older brother paralyzed. And she came to UW determined to pursue a degree that would allow her to work toward better treatments for people with spinal cord injuries. But when she got here, she really wasn't sure this was the right place. She was West Indian American and she felt, and this is her words, like a fly in the milk. As a woman, she sometimes felt out of place in her science and her math courses. And when she performed poorly on some of her initial midterms, she questioned whether she could really succeed here or not. But instead of leaving, she reached out for help. She got a tutor, she drew support from her Posse Scholarship Group, and from a learning community in one of our residence halls that's especially designed for women in science and engineering. Before long, Stephanie became a leader on campus. She's now a mentor, a community volunteer, and a STEM ambassador to the annual biomedical conference for minority students. She'll graduate in May 2019 with a degree in neurobiology and French, and plans to pursue both a PhD and an MD through a dual degree program. Stephanie and the thousands of other students like her, students who have worked hard and achieved much. You heard from four of them with the Distinguished Alumni Awards. These are people who go on to change the world, or at least one small part of it, and they are the reason why we're here. As long as we can continue to inspire students to become the community, the business, the citizen leaders of tomorrow, UW will remain a world-class institution. So thank you for your dedication to this university. Thank you for being here today. I am, as always, honored to be at this university as its chancellor. Thank you all for coming, and I'm going to see you out at the homecoming game. I think we have time to take two or three questions, but I admit the lights are such that I cannot see anyone if they're raising their hands. So, Charlie, can you help me identify anyone who might have a question or a comment or want to talk about anything that's happening on campus? Yeah, over here. Stand up and introduce yourself. Let, let me repeat the question. Um, as some of you know, um, there's someone named Richard Spencer today 
giving a talk at the University of Florida. The Florida governor has declared a state of emergency. Um, there's a lot of controversy around this, and the question is, would we entertain this person coming to campus? All right. Richard Spencer, the individual who's speaking, was involved in Charleston, and one of the people involved in the violence in Charleston, right? Char Char Charlottesville, sorry, get the city right. And um, he actually has invited himself to a number of campuses. Many of those campuses have turned him down. Florida initially turned him down, then were threatened with a free speech lawsuit and decided to invite him, but have put enormous um, controls in place to try to prevent violence there. This is a difficult issue, right? In general, my reaction is anyone should be able to come to campus to speak about any issue, but there is a limit to that, and the limit is when there is actually a threat of real violence. So if, for instance, a speaker asked to come to campus and immediately started seeing on Twitter, on social media, and elsewhere, a whole variety of groups that said, we're going to converge on Madison, bring, bring your guns, bring your torches, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, that there was a real and obvious threat of violence. If the police told me they did not think they could keep this event safe, I would disallow that event. Anything short of that, we would do everything we can. We are a public university. Bascom Hill is a public space. We have had protesters and presence on that hill of people who I can promise you many of you in the room would disagree with on all sides of the political spectrum, and we do everything we can to make that happen. But if you're really going to have dialogue, if you're going to learn and educate and be a university, there has to be some degree of civility and discourse, and when violence is happening, you've really just lost that entirely. So it's a difficult call, right? I, you know, I don't want to make any blanket statements without having a particular context in mind. Yeah, right over here. Ah, the Posse Program, it's a wonderful program. This is a national program that um, works in, I think, six different cities um, around the country. It takes high school students and mentors them who are in low-income families, disadvantaged neighborhoods and schools, and um, basically is a pipeline program to bring them into college. Different schools participate in the, pipe, in the Posse program, and my commitment, we actually are in four different cities, and my commitment is that I will take a posse of 10 students from each of those four cities, and those students come together from that city, and we have posses who are in their next four years, and they mentor the younger students, and um, you know, it's a way that, you know, to provide support for students from going onto a college campus is a very strange environment. They typically come from families where there's been very little background in terms of post high school schooling. And, and um, it's been a very successful program here. As I say, we take posses from four different cities and we're now committed to one of those posses being a STEM posse, which is to say those are 10 students who come who say they want to major in STEM fields. And I'm very proud to say I think our STEM posse, our oldest STEM posse is juniors, and virtually every one of them are still majoring in STEM and have been quite successful academically. So it's a great model and it's a great program for us to partner with. One more question. Got one Is over there here. One? Yeah. Chancellor, would you comment on the UW Systems proposal to merge the two-year and four-year uh, campuses? What effect will that have yeah. on UW Madison? For those of you who aren't here in, uh, in the state, um, last week, the UW System announced that its college, it, ha it has a separate unit that runs both the extension program and the two years colleges. And it announced that it was going to dissolve that unit and merge it into other institutions. There are, I'm going to get the number wrong, about 10 two year schools around the state. 13, 13 thank you. And uh, they are going to merge various groups of those schools, depending on where they're located into some of the other four-year schools. We're not getting any of the two-year schools. It's going to be a little controversial. Those two-year schools are in deep trouble because of the demographics. Their applications and attendance have plummeted in recent years. And the effort here is to make sure that those schools can thrive by merging administration and planning and perhaps doing some joint teaching with some of the four-year schools in the state. What we will, um, our involvement in this, is the, the cooperative extension program which um, at every other state that I know of um, sits at the land-grant university and was here until the mid to late 1960s. This is the program that has people out in every county working on outreach in the county. It started as an agricultural outreach, but it's now does far more than that. The extension program will come back to Madison. 
And um, in my opinion, I think that's a wonderful thing for us. I very much hope it's going to be a good thing for the extension program. It gives us much more involvement and outreach all across the state in a very visible way. And I think we can support the extension program very effectively. And I know there's enormous enthusiasm by quite a few people on campus about reintegrating extension back to campus. So I, I'm very enthusiastic about what this means for UW-Madison. All right, thank you all very much. It's good to see you. Thank you, Chancellor Blank, for your remarks, and thanks to all of you for attending the luncheon today. If you didn't get them on your way in, I encourage you to pick up on your way out at Points of Pride handout or the projects and the Project 72 booklet. They're great information to have. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon. Happy homecoming, and on Wisconsin.